media members go nuts over the realization that Christians actually exist. Rudy Giuliani makes a boo-boo, and Beta O'Rourke writes a diary entry. This is The Ben Shapiro Show. All right, so we have a lot coming up for you on today's show. We are broadcasting live from 77 WABC in New York, which is really exciting because if you didn't know, our podcast is also a radio show, and then there are two additional live hours of the radio show later in the day. WABC is one of our flagship stations, so we're really excited to be here, and thanks so much to the folks at the station for allowing us to make it happen. I want to get to all the news of the day, and there is a lot of news. But first, let me remind you that you're going to die. I know, it's really uplifting. I know it's really exciting. But the fact is that you're going to plot, and because you're going to plot, this is why you should be a responsible adult and buy yourself some life insurance. The best way for you to buy life insurance is to go to Policy Genius. Policy Genius has created a website that makes it easy for you to compare quotes, get advice, get covered without extra fees or commission sales agents. Policy Genius is indeed the easiest way because you can just compare quotes from top insurers. It's competitive. You find the coverage you need at a price you can afford. From there, you can apply online, and the advisors at Policy Genius will handle all the red tape for you. They'll even negotiate your rate with the insurance company, all part of that best price guarantee. And Policy Genius doesn't just make life insurance easy. Whether you're shopping for disability insurance to protect your income, or homeowner's insurance, or auto insurance, they can help you get covered fast. So, if you've been intimidated or frustrated by insurance in the past, try starting your search at policygenius.com. In minutes, you can compare quotes and apply. You can do the whole thing on your phone right this very second. In fact, you probably should. Whatever you're doing, just take the phone, go to policygenius.com, get that life insurance, because you don't know what's gonna happen in the next five minutes. You could be electrocuted, there could be an asteroid that hits you. Whatever, make sure you have life insurance. Policy Genius, the easy way to compare and buy life insurance. Again, that's policygenius.com. They make it easy for you to buy that life insurance so you don't have to be worried about being buried in a pauper's grave and leaving your family bereft if, God forbid, you were to die right now. Okay, you didn't die, so you're still here. So let's talk about the news of the day. So the news of the day, the big story that the media are aghast over, they are agog over this story. It is just, it's a shocking, appalling story. There are these things, these crazy people. They're called Christians. And they exist en masse in the United States. There are many of them, as it turns out. Many, many Christians all across the United States. They're really weird, these Christians. They go to things called churches, which is like a big building. It has a cross on top. You may have driven past it. You may have seen it once in a while. And at these churches, they go into the church, and then they open a book. And this book is really thick. It has lots of words in it. And they're associated in sentences that are called verses. And they open this book, which I've heard is called the Bible, and they open it up, and then they read things in this Bible. And they actually believe the crazy things they read in this Bible. And if you are a reporter, you have never heard of these things, because these things are very bad. These things are like traditional morality about sex, which is really bad, because as we all know, the only type of sex that is bad, the only type of sex that is bad is the one that is not physically pleasing. All other sex is good, but traditional Christians don't think that. They actually think that certain types of sex are sinful. And Christians think a lot of other weird things too about like this weird sky god and all that kind of stuff. Well, the reason that I bring this up is that CNN reporters are now discovering that these Christians exist. And it's, it's opened up a whole new lens on the world for them. It's like they're walking around and every day, and it's like, oh my God, they suddenly realize that half the population is, is vampires. CNN reporter Kate Bennett describes herself as on the floatus beat, meaning that she covers the First Lady of the United States. She's a White House reporter for CNN. Well, she tweeted out about a story yesterday about Karen Pence. Now, as we all know, when we think of the face of evil, we think of Karen Pence, the wife of, of Mike Pence. Clearly, a dastardly, dastardly villain. Why? Because Karen Pence taught at a Christian school for 12 years, and she happens to be the wife of the VP. She's actually a very nice lady. Her kids are delightful. I've met her children. I've met the vice president as well. She's a nice lady, but because she's a nice lady, that just shows she's even more evil. Why? Because now she's going back to teaching at a Christian school. And she's teaching at this Christian school, which happens to believe things that Christians have believed for a couple of thousand years, which is breaking news to Kate Bennett because the world started spinning when Kate Bennett was born, apparently. So she tweeted out again, she's a CNN reporter. So let me get this straight. The second lady of the United States has chosen to work at a school that openly discriminates against LGBT adults and children. Well, what this makes it sound like is that Karen Pence is like heading on over to the local Sharia law school, and there she is teaching about the evils of homosexuality. That's not what's happening. She's an art teacher, and she's teaching at a traditional Christian school. This Christian school is very bad, though. It's called the Emanuel Christian School. It enrolls kindergartners through eighth graders at its campus in Springfield, Virginia. And if you want to go to the school, you know, voluntarily, like you, it's a Christian school that teaches Christian principles. And if you're a Christian who wants to voluntarily attend this Christian school, then you have to sign an agreement that you're going to abide by Christian standards of conduct. Now, as 
a religious person, as a religious Jew. We have exactly the same thing in the Jewish community, right? I went to a Jewish day school. The Jewish day school I went to, it wasn't just that you had to abide by particular standards of sexual morality. Your, your parents also had to keep Sabbath. You had to keep kosher, right? At any of these voluntary associations, you actually have to abide by the rules of the association. Shockingly, voluntary associations, you actually have to abide by the rules of the association. So what is so terrible? Well, in the Articles of Employment, which requires applicants to sign their initials next to a list of beliefs, Emmanuel Christian defines marriage and sexual identity. It says, I understand that the term marriage has only one meaning, the uniting of one man and one woman. I know, mind blown. This is brand new stuff to folks in the media. And it also adds that certain moral misconduct would be disqualifying for both students and teachers, such as heterosexual activity outside of marriage, like premarital sex, cohabitation, extramarital sex, homosexual or lesbian sexual activity, polygamy, transgender identity, any other violation of the unique roles of male and female. And so this is very bad. It's absurd. It's just terrible. Because how could the non-elected vice president's wife go and teach at a Christian school that preaches actual like long-lasting traditional Christian values. It's just insane that you would actually go teach at a Christian school. Now, this is called a Christian being a Christian and doing Christian things in their Christian life. Right? This is just how Christians operate in the daily world, traditional Christians. It's how traditional Jews operate in the daily world. By the way, it's how traditional Muslims operate in the daily world. Right? If you are a religious person of any of the three Abrahamic faiths and you are really traditional in your religious observance, then all the things that I just listed, you also believe. But this is really bad according to Kate Bennett. So she's a reporter, but she's never heard of a religious person before. She's a White House reporter for CNN who has never heard of a Christian. Breaking news, Mike Pence's wife, who is a Christian, is working at a Christian school that believes in Christian principles that people can voluntarily associate with. So here's the question. Who's really intolerant here? Who's the really discriminatory person here? Mike Pence's wife, who is joining a private school that is privately funded and not publicly funded, and engaging in voluntary association that has nothing to do with public policy, or a CNN reporter saying that Mike Pence's wife is disgracing the country by doing this. No media bias, by the way. This is all objective news journalism over at CNN. But this goes to a really difficult issue for a lot of folks on the left, and that is a lot of folks on the left actually believe that religion itself, traditional religion itself in the United States, must be quashed in order for freedom to reign, not just on a legal level, but on a cultural level as well. People must be shamed for associating with traditional religious organizations. So the New York Times, which of course was also shocked to learn about religious people, they quoted a woman named Elizabeth Shackman Hurd, a professor of politics and religion at Northwestern University. She said that the school's requirements appeared more extreme than other religious schools and noted that not all Christians would agree with them. Well, no bleep, Sherlock. I mean, of course not all Christians would agree with them, but some Christians agree with them, namely the Christians who are going to the school and who fund the school and who pay to go to the school. And as far as these requirements being more extreme than other religious schools, I'd like seeing some poll data on that. I would bet you money that virtually every Catholic school in the country has extraordinarily similar requirements. Every Orthodox school that I know of has similar requirements. And then this professor says that Mrs. Pence's choice of employment was not surprising because the school's values appeared to mirror those of the Trump administration. And this is where they're really going, right? The vice president's wife, who is not elected, is teaching at a Christian school that she taught at for a dozen years before but now, this is a reflection on the Trump administration's evil. So Professor Hurd says, given the exclusionary nationalism in this administration, clearly she is a clear-eyed, objective viewer of this administration, and sorts of politics taken on various things, it would not be at all surprising for the second lady to associate herself with some prominent fashion with an institution like this. It raises important issues about education and diversity and what kind of forward-facing public officials we want representing our country at home and abroad. And again, the application clearly states that certain things are necessary if you want to join, which is not a problem. But here's the thing. What the left wants to do is shame people into not being part of churches, right? That's really what they want. What they want is that anytime a public figure is a member of a church, unless you're Barack Obama and you go to Jeremiah Wright's church for 20 years, where he preaches outright hatred of the United States, hatred of Jews, the 9-11 was the chickens coming home to roost, right? Then if you mention that, by the way, that you're a racist, right? If you mention Jeremiah Wright, a pastor so close to Barack Obama that Barack Obama literally named his second book, The Audacity of Hope, after a speech called The Audacity of Hope given by Jeremiah Wright. If you mention that, and you say, well, maybe his ideas are linked to Jeremiah Wright and so on. They go, no, that's his private religious belief. How dare you, sir? How dare you? But if you're a member of the Knights of Columbus, then Maisie Hirono of Hawaii will come after you, the senator from Hawaii. And if you're Karen Pence, not even an elected politician serving in the federal government, 
and you go to a Christian school, or you go to a church, then we're going to shame the living daylights out of you. Now, listen, I think it's fair game to criticize people's views. You want to criticize Karen Pence's traditional religious views? Go for it. You want to criticize my traditional religious views? Believe me, I've had plenty of people who have done it. I don't mind. That's part of the political back and forth and the religious back and forth that we go through every day in this country. It's part of what makes the country good is that we can have these conversations. But to shame somebody as though they've done something uniquely terrible by going and teaching at a Christian school is nothing but a cultural attempt to quash religion itself. And that cultural attempt is not going to stay cultural. Right? It begins with, it is culturally bad. It is just wrong on every level for Karen Pence to associate with a church like this. Now, what's funny is that Bennett, this, this reporter from CNN, then tweeted back at me. And she said, well, listen, you know, I'm really not all that upset about religious freedom. She says, I have absolutely nothing against religious people or our freedom to practice faith. First of all, both of those statements are lies. Obviously, she doesn't like religious people because if a religious person believes something she doesn't like, she doesn't like what they're doing. And she says she's a, she, she has nothing against freedom to practice faith. She literally said that she found it appalling that somebody was practicing their religious faith because that's exactly what she's talking about. But then she continues, but I do feel when one is a representative of the country, okay, quick correction, Karen Pence is not a representative of the country. She's not an elected official. I know we play this stupid game where we assume that the spouses of elected officials are now elected officials. I know we've been doing this since Hillary Clinton where we pretend, oh, well, when you elect Bill, you get Hillary too. And you know what happened when Bill kept saying that? Hillary's approval rating dropped to 30% for a first lady. Michelle Obama was really unpopular until she realized, wait a second, I'm not an elected official. Maybe I should stop acting like an elected official. Right? It really is, it's an amazing thing. But in any case, you know, she, this, this, uh, this idea that Karen Pence is representative of the country and therefore she's doing something deeply wrong. Again, great, great reporting there from CNN. Okay, in just a second, in just a second, I want to talk a little bit about how this is not going to stay a cultural issue. This is going to turn into a legal issue quite quickly. First, we need to talk about your underwear. I know, hell of a transition. Tommy John has the most comfortable underwear for everyone on the planet. You can count on their products to be snug and neat to stay in one place. Their underwear sports a no wedgie guarantee, comfortable stay put waistbands, and a range of fabrics that are luxuriously soft, designed to move with you, not against you. That means there's no bunching and no riding up, which would certainly help the reporters over at CNN. Plus, Tommy John has a life-changing women's line and luxurious hibernation-approved loungewear for men and women. They're so confident in their underwear, that if you don't love your first pair, you can get a full refund with their best pair you'll ever wear or it's free guarantee. So, what have you got to lose? Before you spend another dime on multi-pack underwear, remember, there's a better way to stay comfortable. Tommy John, no adjustment needed. Go check them out right now at tommyjohn.com slash Ben for 20% off your first order. That's tommyjohn.com slash Ben for 20% off. Again, tommyjohn.com. I'm wearing their underwear right now. I can, I can speak to the comfort of these things. It's really fantastic. Go check them out. Right now, they have a lot of great products, and you get a special discount when you go to tommyjohn.com slash Ben. You get 20% off. Again, tommyjohn.com slash Ben. Go check them out, tommyjohn.com. Okay, so what exactly is this cultural, what is this cultural rage going to turn into? It's going to turn into a legal attempt to quash religion. That is where this is going, and it's already happening in New York State. Now, the way that folks on the left like to portray their attempted crackdowns on religion is as non-discrimination law. And they have all these non-discrimination laws they've been passing across the country. And what these non-discrimination laws say is that you're not allowed to discriminate based on, for example, sexual orientation. Now, listen, I'm not a believer that you should discriminate on the basis of sexual orientation when you're running a business. Right? We have gay people who work at Daily Wire. I'm sure there are gay people who work at WABC. Like, we don't care. Like, no, nobody cares. But in my synagogue, it's a different story. If the idea is that my synagogue has to hire people who are homosexual, or that my synagogue has to perform same-sex marriages, or that it's going to lose its nonprofit status or its tax-exempt status, then you have the state impinging on religious freedom. And that is where all of this is going to go. It's going to start with the schools, because the case is going to be made, and it already is being made in the state of California, the idiotic state from which I hail. It's already being made there that if you teach your children traditional morality, you're damaging your children. You're doing something deeply wrong by teaching your children traditional morality. In fact, there's a guy named Angelo Curson who's the head of Media Matters for America, most famous for leading boycotts nonsensically against various hosts. He was very angry at, at Karen Pence. And then he suggested that Karen Pence and Christian parents are basically indoctrinating their kids into bigotry. This is the case that's going to be made by a lot of folks on the left, that if you bring up your kid in traditional religious fashion, then what you're actually doing is damaging your own child. Now, 
He also was very angry that we at Daily Wire had covered the story where a 10-year-old boy was being dressed in drag and then taking photographs next to naked drag queens. He said we shouldn't have covered that. That was really, that was really impinging on the rights of the parents. So to get this straight, in his view, dangerous is pointing out that it's bad for parents to dress their 10-year-old boys in drag and let them take pictures next to naked men. Not, uh, but but what is what is really really dangerous is that if if you if you have your kid go to a Bible class, that's that's really really scary stuff. Okay, so how is this all going to become enshrined in law? Well, the first step is going to be something like what New York State passed this week. So New York State Senate passed this week a law banning gay conversion therapy on minors. This is the way they pitch it. So they pitch the good parts of the law, but they don't pitch the entire law. So the, the good parts of the law is when they say that they ban gay conversion therapy. This is basically a discredited evidence-free version of you're going to turn a homosexual person straight or something by talking to them. Okay, there's not a lot of evidence that any of that works. With that said, in a free country, if I decide that I want to take my 13-year-old boy to see a therapist and the therapist wants to talk about the kid's sexual orientation and whether the kid might be confused about sexual orientation, I don't see why that should be illegal. I think that that's a vast overstep just from a libertarian perspective, not even from a traditionalist perspective. Okay, but let's say that you think that that should be illegal. That's not all the law does. Okay, the, the state legally declared that being lesbian, gay, bisexual, or transgender is not a disease, disorder, illness, deficiency, or shortcoming. I'm not sure how you can by law declare that being transgender is not a disorder. It is literally called gender identity disorder. I don't know how you can do that. But it goes even further than that. It bans people. We talked about this yesterday on, on the radio show. It bans people who are therapists from discussing gender dysphoria with people in any honest way. So if you have a 10-year-old kid who comes in and says, I know I'm a biological boy, but I'm actually a girl on the inside. And you as a therapist say, well, you know, let's think this one through. You could be guilty of violating the law in New York State. Okay, the same agenda is going to be pressed down on these various schools. So take this law and see how it applies to Emanuel Christian School, the, the school where Karen Pence is teaching. The law prevents you from discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation. It also prevents you from suggesting in any way that a biological male is a biological male and a biological female is a biological female because transgenderism is just the natural state of the world. Okay, the, the way this is going to be used is, number one, they will remove the tax exempt status for all religious organizations across the country. That is the way the left is moving. And they will use as their sort of test case the Bob Jones University case from 1981. So there's a very famous Supreme Court case, Bob Jones University, in which the IRS decided that they were going to remove the tax-exempt status for Bob Jones University. Bob Jones University had a very stupid policy that banned interracial dating. And the IRS said, that's really bad. We're going to end their tax-exempt status. Now, it may be really bad. And maybe you need Congress to rewrite the statutes. But the IRS didn't have the statutory authority to just say that things that are bad no longer get tax-exempt status. But the Supreme Court ruled that because Bob Jones was discriminatory, therefore the tax-exempt status could be removed. Once these non-discrimination bills are passed in states across the country, the next move will be to go to all these religious institutions and say to them that you must accept same-sex marriages being performed from your pulpit. You must accept gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender teachers at your religious school. And if you don't, then you will lose not only your nonprofit status, but your accreditation. And once you lose your nonprofit status and your accreditation, your kids are going to have to go to the local public school. And if you decide to homeschool them, then we are not going to allow you to homeschool them unless you fulfill our certain basic educational requirements. This is the direction in which the left is moving, and it is open discrimination. And to pretend that it is not is foolish. The people who are cramming down their values at this point are not religious theocrats. Religious theocrats are not cramming down their values. Mike Pence is not attempting to make homosexual activity illegal. I can't name a Republican across the country who is. None of them are. Republicans across the country are not trying to imprison people who are transgender. No one is doing this. The people who are trying to impinge on the rights and freedoms of others are the people in the secular left world who have decided that religion itself is discriminatory and infringes freedom. This has always been, by the way, the way that religious minorities are persecuted. The way that religious minorities are persecuted in countries across the world is that they run up against the prevailing social order, and that social order is allowed to step on the minorities that are infringing what the social order is attempting to do. And it's why, whether that discrimination is coming from Islamic tyrannies in the Middle East, or whether that discrimination is coming from European states that are attempting to crush Christianity, it does not matter. If you are attempting to crush private religious practice that has no impact on public policy because you don't like that religious practice, you are a bigot and you're a tyrant. And that is the direction that the modern American left is moving. It's, it's astonishing. It's astonishing. There's a reason, by the way, that Christianity around the world is suffering a huge increase in, in persecution. And you've seen that the Chinese government has 
been particularly active in trying to quash religious freedom in China because tyrannies recognize that the rebellion that exists within those tyrannical societies generally comes from religious people who believe in individual rights and families. And, that, and, and thus, you have to have China cracking down. What's been amazing is to watch Western secular companies basically be okay with that. Right? Doing the work of China. You got Google that's actually tailoring its apps for Chinese use without reference to the human rights violations that are taking place in China. It's, it's pretty amazing and, and pretty frightening. And again, we, we should take it seriously when the left says that they don't like religion because they mean it. They mean it. By the way, they don't like Western civilization either. The term Western civilization. There's an actual op-ed in the Washington Post today by David Perry and Matthew Gabriel suggesting that the term Western civilization is itself racist. So they, they say that because Steve King once used the term Western civilization, Western civilization, like the term, is racist. Which means that we have to ban the term Western civilization or at least pretend that Western civilization no longer holds. The truth is that a lot of the objections to Christianity and Judeo-Christian values and Western civilization are built on a Marxist premise that America and Western civilized countries are inherently racist, sexist, bigoted, homophobic, and must be torn out by the roots. So Christianity has to go because it's bigoted. Even though Christianity, by the way, the Christian world is the basis for all the rights and freedoms that you enjoy today. I don't care whether you are secular. I don't care whether you are religious. We live in a world defined by the Judeo-Christian ethic. That's what made the West different from every other place on planet Earth. And to pretend that that ethic was completely thrown out with the Enlightenment, that what the Enlightenment was about was saying, churches are wrong, we're just not going to do church anymore. That is to ignore the fact that virtually every value that we hold dear is rooted in a Judeo-Christian tradition. The most important sentence ever written in the history of humanity is that man is made in God's image. It is the beginning and end point of virtually all moral arguments. That is an argument that is made by the Judeo-Christian religion. The argument for personal liberty, that you have inherent rights. The argument that virtue matters so that we can have freedom. All of this arises in a Western civilization defined by these values. So if you wanted to do away with those values, if you wanted the collective to be more important than the individual, the best way to do it would be to attack Christianity and Judaism at their roots, would be to attack religion and tear those away. And again, the, the ironic part of this is that this is the least threatening time for theocracy in world history, at least from the Judeo-Christian side. And we're being treated as though Karen Pence is the true threat to liberty. Karen Pence. Not the, not the Democrats who are attempting to stop judges from being appointed to the bench based on their membership in the Knights of Columbus. Okay, in just a second, I want to talk a little bit about the latest from Rudy Giuliani. But first, I need to talk to you about the watch that you're wearing. You see that thing on your wrist? It's ugly. I don't know why you're wearing it. You shouldn't be wearing it. What you should be wearing is a movement watch because movement watches are great. You see, the, what I'm, you see this sleek, elegant thing on my wrist? You see this? It's magnificent. Okay, that is a movement watch. Movement is a ground-up entrepreneurial company, a true success story. They have sold legitimately hundreds of thousands of watches. There's a reason I have a movement watch. My wife has one. Both my parents have one. They make great gifts. And what's great is that they cut out the middleman. These aren't watches that are, by the way, going to tell you how many steps you take or how many calories you burn. These are watches that are going to tell you the time, and they're going to do it in an elegant, sleek fashion. These watches start at like 95 bucks. You're looking at 400 bucks for the same quality from a traditional brand. Because they cut out the middleman, they were able to sell it cheaper online. Movement has sold almost 2 million watches in over 160 countries. And right now, you get 15% off today with free shipping and free returns just by going to mvmt.com slash Shapiro. Again, that is mvmt.com slash Shapiro. You get 15% off today. They have all sorts of other great products. They have like sunglasses and, and they have bracelets, all sorts of good stuff. Go check them out. mvmt.com slash Shapiro. Once again, mvmt.com slash Shapiro. Okay, so... Meanwhile, uh, in, in more political news, Rudy Giuliani made a bit of a boo-boo today. So the, the president's lawyer, Rudy Giuliani, has the hardest job in America. There are two, the two hardest jobs in America are being the person who cleans up after pop stars at hotels and being, and being Donald Trump's and being Donald Trump's lawyer. That's, that is a rough job. As a lawyer, there are certain clients that you just dread, and Donald Trump is that client. Because the first rule of lawyering is you tell your client to shut up. That legitimately is like the first, no matter what the situation, the first rule of lawyering is cut off all communications between you and the other side. I don't care whether we're talking transactional law or criminal law, but particularly when you are in the midst of a massive counterintelligence slash criminal investigation into Russian collusion, first rule, tell your client to shut up. Second rule, your client actually has to tell you the truth so that you can form a legal strategy around it. Third rule is don't say stupid stuff on TV. All three of these rules are routinely violated by President Trump's legal team. So Rudy Giuliani was on CNN yesterday with Chris Cuomo, a physical block of wood, and he was explaining to Chris Cuomo that President Trump personally did not collude with Russia, but maybe somebody did, which is like 
dude, dude, like what now? <laughs> there, there are those of us who've been saying no evidence of collusion for a long time. You're kind of switching the story on us a little bit. Here's what Rudy Giuliani had to say. I never said there was no collusion between the campaign or between people in the campaign. Yes, I have, have no idea if there, I have not. I said the you, president of the United States, there is not a single bit of evidence the president of the United States committed the only crime you could commit here, conspired with the Russians to hack the DNC. First. He said he didn't. He didn't say nobody. How would you know that nobody in your campaign- He actually did say that, R Rudy. He said well, I nobody, said and that. then he said as far as I know. he said that, he said it in a, well, as far as he knows, that's true. Now, there's part of what Rudy's saying that's probably true, and part of what he's saying that is certainly false. The part that he's saying that's certainly false is when he says that Trump didn't say that nobody colluded with the Russians. No, Trump actually has said that. Like, Trump actually has said, my campaign did not collude with the Russians. Nobody colluded with, the, like, collusion wasn't a thing. So that's, but at this point, are we, like, surprised that Trump didn't tell the truth about that kind of thing, that he overstated his case? This is a guy who said he didn't sleep with Stormy Daniels. It, he, he, I'm sorry, the president of the United States does not make good legal defenses of himself because he just says whatever comes into his head at any given moment. But the part where Rudy has a defensible truth, it's, it's ugly, but it's defensible, is I think the case he's gonna make, and this sort of looks forward to the Mueller report, the case that he's probably going to make is that, is that the president of the United States didn't personally know about anything. The people in his campaign who were doing bad stuff were acting outside the scope of agency. In other words, they were just kind of acting out on their own. So Manafort was freelancing when he was talking with the Russians. Maybe that's a case, but dude, don't spill that on national TV, not the way to do it. So even as Rudy Giuliani stumbles out the gate when talking about the Mueller investigation, the good news is for, for the Republicans that the Democrats are not doing themselves any favor. Beto O'Rourke today, I, I will say the Democrats have been totally taken over by the social media wing of their party. Now, as, as a big user of social media, I'm fond of social media, but social media isn't necessarily the best way to weed out deep thinkers. There's a reason that Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez is about to teach, I, I kid you not, a session to older lawmakers on how to tweet. She, this is according to USA Today. The House Democratic Policy and Communications Committee is hosting a session Thursday morning with Ocasio-Cortez on the most effective ways to engage constituents on Twitter and the importance of digital storytelling. Rule number one, be a pretty young woman. I mean, that, and then when, if you can't fulfill rule number one, then you're basically, you're screwed at that point. I mean, if you're, if you're a Democrat, and you are 70 years old, you're not gonna get good at social media anytime soon. What's made her popular on social media is the fact that she is likable on social media, she is sassy on social media, and of course she's pretty. So that does make a difference. But she is teaching Democrats the most important things in life, how to be good on social media. Beto O'Rourke, meanwhile, is running for president. He's polling number two in a lot of these polls. It's showing Biden and then Beto O'Rourke. And Biden seems to be dropping by the day because he's old and boring. Beto O'Rourke is the hot new thing because he rides a skateboard. And because he has like a big, he has bangs on his face and just kind of flicks his hair back because he's cool. So he has a piece today in medium.com. I, I love that this guy's one of the front runners. I love it so much, Bob O'Rourke. So he's got, a, he's got a piece in medium talking about his travels. And he is essentially skater boy Jack Kerouac. That's, that's what he's going for here. I'm gonna read some of this to you because it is worthy of note. I mean, it isn't really, but the fact that he wrote it makes it worthy of note. Here is what he writes. He writes, a lot of big trucks rolling down Pancake Boulevard and there aren't any sidewalks. Gloomy early morning sky in liberal Kansas. Snow melt on the side of the road where I'm running. I find a vacant lot to cut through to another street, also busy and without sidewalks. I was in Tucumcari yesterday, trying to learn more about the town that my great grandparents lived in more than 100 years ago. I stayed at the Motel Safari, one of these classic Route 66 motels, mid-century everything. Take a break come back stronger. I'm, I'm not kidding you. This is a presidential candidate who wrote these things. And he is being treated by the media as like, wow, what depth, what, what thoughts emerge from the massive brains? Christian, simple-minded, Beta O'Rourke, super deep. The, the best part is when he starts talking about his own personal attitude. He says, the next morning I ran just a couple of miles down 66, then through neighborhoods past the History Museum. My leg has been really bothering me since the campaign. And so I'd stopped running for a while. This is my first run in more than a month. Felt good, running in new shoes. Have been stuck lately, in and out of a funk. My last day of work was January 2nd. It's been more than 20 years since I was last not working. Maybe if I get moving on the road, meet people, learn about what's going on where they live, have some adventure, go where I don't know and I'm not known, it'll clear my head, reset, 
I'll think new thoughts, break out of loops I've been stuck in. He's like 17. Hey, honest to God, he's like going on a European backpacking trip. It's amazing. He sounds like Timothy Treadwell right before he got eaten by bears in Grizzly Man. I'm gonna go up to Alaska, live in a bus, talk to the bears, find myself. If my kidneys are clawed out of me, well, that's just the way it goes, man. That's the price of adventure. And then he talks about all the people he meets. This thing is thousands of words long. Thousands. Because he just has this kind of genius to convey to you. It's amazing. I, I, I'm, I'm scrolling. I'm still scrolling. I'm still scrolling. It, it, and he, he finally concludes by saying, a young woman asked, how do I make a difference in any of this? I said, run for office. Hold town hall meetings. Bring people together over coffee, over beer. Ask your elected reps to show up and be part of the conversation. If they don't, organize to get their attention. But whatever we do, let's do it together. <sighs> the platitude primary continues apace. It, it really astonishing stuff from Beto O'Rourke. I mean, when he's not, when he's not actually taping his, when, when he's not busy taping his dental appointments, apparently he is busy running around and, and writing about his experiences in Texas. He must have been the worst in high school, right? I mean, like, he's the worst now, so he must be the worst in high school also. Okay, in a second, I want to talk a little bit more about the various Democratic candidates who are being upheld by the media. We'll get to that in just a second. Plus, the Democrats trying to push off the State of the Union address, what that is really about. We'll get to all that. First, you're going to have to go to Facebook and subscribe. You want to see the rest of this show live? You want to actually view this massively handsome face? Go check it out at dailywire.com for the rest of the show. When you subscribe, you get the rest of the show live. You get the rest of Michael Knowles' show live. You get the rest of Andrew Clavin's show live. Plus, when you subscribe, you also get two additional hours. You do a live radio show in the afternoons, and you actually get to see that, and you get to do it on demand. You get to see it without commercials. But only if you subscribe when you spend 99 bucks a year, you also get our famous Leftist Tears Hot or Cold Tumblr. When we're on the road, we activate the invisibility button. So I'm holding it up right here, but you can't see it because that's just how magical it is. You can check that out when you get the annual subscription. Also, reminder, tomorrow, the Ben Shapiro Show will be live at the March for Life in Washington, D.C. at 10 a.m. Eastern. I'll be live streaming at the National Mall on 12th Street. So if you're planning to go to the march, come out and hang out. The show is going to be entirely about pro-life topics. We're going to do a themed show, which we never do, but the March for Life is a really important thing. We will also have a special guest who will be on the show, so you're not going to want to miss that. Also, I have lots of announcements. I'm kicking off my Spring 2019 Young America's Foundation Tour with my latest event at George Washington University. The speech is called, You're Free, Stop Whining. So tune in at 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Pacific at yaf.org slash live so you don't miss out on any of the melting of the leftist snowflakes that is sure to come. This is where all the Ben Shapiro Destroys videos come from. Uh, I'm not going to say that we're behind them because we're only behind some of them, but the reality is that if you want to see that happen live in real time, you have to go to yaf.org slash live. Also subscribe so that you get the Sunday special. We have Lieutenant Colonel Alan West on at YouTube, iTunes, subscribe. Thanks so much for all your help. We are the largest, fastest growing conservative podcast and radio show in the nation. All righty, so it's not just Beta O'Rourke who is being given the king's treatment by the media. It's also Kamala Harris, who is really... I, I find her radically unlikable. I know, I'm not supposed to say that. It is super sexist. If you say that a woman is unlikable, it is pretty much the most sexist thing you can say about a woman, is that she is unlikable. Like that time that Barack Obama said that Hillary Clinton was unlikable. That was super sexist. Well, Kamala Harris, I don't find particularly likable, but the media are trying super hard to sell her. Like really hard. By the way, I always find it weird when people say unlikable, sexist term. Have you ever met Ted Cruz? Like really, like I, I know Senator Cruz. I like Senator Cruz. In per he doesn't come off great on camera, there's a certain likability factor that just matters in politics. In any case, ABC News has an entire piece today on her. It's ABC News, really journalisming everywhere. And it's, it's, it's incredible. It's from Good Morning America. Listen to this headline. This is a news headline. This is not a teen beat headline, celebrities that are just like us headline. Here's the actual headline. Potential 2020 presidential candidate Kamala Harris shares advice for young women. Don't let anybody tell you who you are. You tell them who you are. That's a headline, a news headline. I know it's been a real problem for me is when I walk up to people and I just say, Bob, and the guy's like, no, I'm Jim. I'm like, no, I'm gonna tell you who you are, you're Bob. That's, that's been a real problem. I, in fact, I actually do this every day when I go to the coffee shop. I, I don't let them tell me who I am. I tell them who I am so that they can write it on the cup and then I can get my coffee. She is just the most platitudinous politician in the world. My favorite quote from this interview that ABC News is touting is, quote, if it's worth fighting for, then it's a fight worth having. Okay, <laughs> okay. If the sky is blue, then it is also blue. 
And, and then she, like, it's, it's just a list. I actually listed it out on my Twitter feed this morning. She dropped no less than 13 platitudes in the course of an interview. Every sentence she said was a platitude. Every single one. She actually says things like, she, she, she's asked for advice. Here's a piece of advice for young women. You ready for this? This is groundbreaking. This is the kind of stuff that ought to make you president. This is groundbreaking advice for young women, according to Good Morning America. Quote, surround yourself with really good friends. Groundbreaking advice from the front-running presidential candidate, Kamala Harris. She says, it's really important because none of us have achieved the success we have without really good friends. Mind blown. I, I, my, I, I don't know what to say about that. It's just the genius rolls off her in waves. Pretty amazing. Okay, I want to give you a quick update on the Steve King story because I want to get to the State of the Union stuff in a second. But the Steve King story is, is, pretty, is pretty telling. Uh, th this is an update. Okay, the Steve King story, as you all know, Representative Steve King from Iowa, he was asked, he, he actually asked in a New York Times interview how the terms white nationalist and white supremacist became offensive, right, according to the New York Times. And a bunch of Republicans and Democrats looked to censor Steve King. A bunch of them looked to censure him for his racial comments. So what did Democrats do? Did they vote for the censure? They run the House, after all. So why didn't they just vote for the censure? Instead, House Democratic leaders blocked an effort to censure Steve King for racial comments. They referred the measure to the House Ethics Committee for further review. Why would they do such a thing? Don't they hate racist comments? Well, it turns out what they are afraid of is that if they censure Steve King, they are also going to have to start censuring the, their members of their own caucus for saying racist stuff. Really, I'm not saying this. They are saying this. Jim Clyburn admitted as much. Clyburn, who's the House Majority Whip, he noted that King made his statements to the news media, not during House proceedings. He said, I don't know it's a good thing for us to talk about censure for things that are done outside the business of the House of Representatives. He said, we should be very, very careful about doing anything that constrains or seems to constrain speech. I know, Democrats are deeply concerned about doing anything that might constrain speech. It's one of their chief concerns in life, which is why they promote hate speech laws and why they talk about microaggressions and intersectionality endlessly. And then Bobby Rush ripped into, ripped into Clyburn. He, he said that Clyburn's disapproval resolution was almost meaningless, but Clyburn says, listen, here's the problem. If we censure Steve King, how many of you have been saying nice things about Louis Farrakhan for years? How many of you have been saying bad things about Jews? Like today, Representative Ilhan Omar, who's an anti-Semite, went on CNN, and not only did she double down on her anti-Semitism, she also suggested in an open national interview, she became the second Democratic representative to do this in the last day, that Lindsey Graham was being blackmailed by President Trump because Lindsey Graham is gay. And she said that in an interview on CNN. Then when she was asked about it, she said, many people are saying. Now, I'm old enough to remember when many people are saying was used as a way to club President Trump, because this is what Trump does all the time, right? Trump says something that's unsupported or unsupportable, and then when asked if that's true, he goes, well, many people are saying. is what many people say. And people are like, well, who are these people? Are they you? And this is, but Democrats are now allowed to do this. But what Clyburn is afraid of is that he might actually have to censure his own members because they say crazy stuff too. Turns out that when you have a group of 435 people, there are a bunch of people who say crazy stuff in there. But I love, the, I love the cynicism of Democrats so angry at Steve King that they will not censure him because they might have to censure members of their own caucus for being terrible. But at the same time, we are told by people like Nicole Wallace at MSNBC that really the racism problem only exists on the Republican side of the aisle. The Democrats are clean as the driven snow. They have nothing to worry about. Even the Democrats think the Democrats have something to worry about. Even the Democrats think that they might have to censure their own members. Really is amazing stuff. Okay, well, latest on the, on the government shutdown, it continues, of course, and this means that the Democrats now have an excuse to cancel the State of the Union address. As I pointed out yesterday, I could not be happier with this, frankly. Like, I am so excited I don't have to cover the State of the Union address, I can barely speak about it. It makes me so happy. I hate the State of the Union address with a deep, abiding passion because it is monarchic. It is just terrible. You have the president walk in as though he's the crown prince of England, and then everybody pats him on the back and they take selfies with him. And then they'll stand and cheer, oh, you're the president. Okay, when the Constitution was written, it was the legislature that was supposed to be the predominant branch of government, not the executive. Yet we treat the executive as though it is the predominant branch of government. And the State of the Union was made into a giant speech by Woodrow Wilson because Woodrow Wilson was, in fact, a quasi-fascist who liked that sort of spectacle. Okay, well, if we get rid of the State of the Union, I'm going to be super happy. I think President Trump should just do it directly from the border. You should declare State of the Union, invite all the members of Congress. They can come down to the border, the ones who want to, the ones who don't, don't have to. And then he can just bring up angel moms and Border Patrol members. I think that'd be great. I think you should totally do that. But the Democrats, the real reason they don't want to do the State of the Union 
it, it's amazing how they even lie about this. Okay, the real reason they don't want to do the State of the Union has nothing to do with inability to do it. It's because they don't want the imagery of President Trump lecturing them about keeping the government shut. So Nancy Pelosi just lied about it yesterday. The Speaker of the House, she said, the reason that we can't do the State of the Union is because it, it won't be safe. Here's the Speaker of the House explaining that one yesterday. That isn't the point. The point is security. And I, as, as, having been in the leadership a long time, have been maybe before you were all here, where they have, uh, we have so prepared in advance for something happening in that chamber. This is a very big deal. It is a special security event. Okay, so she says that it's because of security. That is absolutely false. The Department of Homeland Security head, Nilsen, she says, of course we can support the State of the Union. Of course we can. Like, we, you think we don't have security? Like, at the Congress now? She tweeted out, this is Christian Nielsen, she tweeted out, the Department of Homeland Security and the U.S. Secret Service are fully prepared to support and secure the State of the Union. We thank the service for their mission focus and dedication and for all they do each day to secure our homeland. Okay, it's obviously an excuse. It's obviously an excuse so that Nancy Pelosi does not have to sit there while Trump points to angel moms in the crowd and says, why don't you defend this angel mom? Why don't you defend this wounded person? Why don't you defend this victim of illegal immigration? Right? They're attempting to avoid the consequences of their own position on the government shutdown. It is indicative of how people in the Democratic Party treat national security and security issues generally. So what they say is that there doesn't need to be a wall. Border Patrol is saying, uh, yeah, guys, there does. And then they're like, well, you know what? Homeland Security probably can't do the State of the Union. And Homeland Security is like, no, actually, we, we kind of can. And they say things like, well, the military doesn't need X, Y, and Z. And members of the military say, well, no, actually, we, we could probably use those things. And then they expect us to believe that, we that they take security seriously. It's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. The real reason that Pelosi is not doing the State of the Union is because she doesn't want to be humiliated on a public stage, which is the same reason why she's refusing to meet with the angel moms. Yesterday, a bunch of angel moms went to Nancy Pelosi's office, and she refused to come out or speak with them because why would she? I mean, she understands how optics work. Uh, about your 2019. Americans more than you care about the illegal aliens crossing our borders. Right. These children yeah. have dreams. Every one of these kids had a dream, and they've been crushed. Your actions still matter. Take My son's life is worth more than one dollar, and that's an right. insult to all of us. Okay, there's, there's a reason Nancy Pelosi doesn't want to show up, because obviously she understands how optics work. And I will point out, the amount of media coverage for the angel moms who went to Nancy Pelosi's office was not nearly the amount of media coverage for the four Democratic Congress people who went and searched for Mitch McConnell yesterday. So there were four Democratic Congress people. They went to Mitch McConnell's office and they showed up and they're like, where's Mitch McConnell? Where's Mitch McConnell? First of all, Mitch McConnell is trying to work out his next cocaine shipment, right? He's cocaine Mitch. We know what he's doing with his off hours. But second of all, why would he come out and meet with like Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez? First, I, I, if I were Mitch McConnell, I would, but that's because I'm confrontational. I think it would just be great for Mitch McConnell to walk out and just being all laconic and have her shout in his face. I mean, it would just be great because that, that's how that dynamic would go. She'd get very upset. She'd start yelling at him. Ilhan Omar would start yelling at him and he would just stand there and take it and it would be really amusing. He'd just be like, well, you guys could just fund the border, you know, and he, in his turtle voice. And it would, it would be great. Like, I actually think that more confrontation with Democrats on this issue is, is necessary. But McConnell is not famous for being confrontational. With that said, the State of the Union excuses that are being made right now are obviously horrendous excuses and do not reflect reality in any serious way. It's just another way for Democrats to try and get out of this. And this is the benefit of being able to run on, on the media's love. The polls show right now that the media, uh, the, the, that basically most Americans think that Congress is doing a bad job, think Obama, uh, think that Trump is doing a bad job, that a plurality of Americans, a slight minority of Americans rather, uh, are in support of the wall and that Trump's approval ratings are really low. So all Democrats have to do is stay out of the limelight and just keep shouting Trump. What Trump has to do is shift the narrative. That's very difficult to do in the face of a Democratic Party overwhelmingly united by their hatred of him. What was so terrible about border fencing six years ago? Nothing. What's so terrible about border fencing now? Trump's the president. So that's what's terrible inherently about border fencing, which is the reason that they keep doing this routine. It's really amazing. I, I do love the pitch that Democrats are making as to why the government shutdown is bad, though. That, that I will say I find amusing. So on the one side, you have Trump saying, we need border security so we can ensure that people don't get killed. And on the other side, Bernie Sanders legitimately, legitimately went outside the EPA. He stood outside the EPA and he said, we need the government shutdown to end because of climate change. Like of all the government services that are urgent to provide, the, the EPA administrators are the ones they're not even the ones doing the climate change research. They're the regulators. 
They're, like, if they're gone for a week, nobody notices. In fact, if they're gone forever, nobody's going to notice, except they'll be able to actually build things on their own property. But Bernie thinks that that's the real priority. The difference in priorities is what Democrats are deeply afraid of. It's what President Trump has to keep hammering, and it's what the media will refuse to cover. So that, that's the real reason why Democrats are trying to run away desperately from the State of the Union address. They don't actually want Trump to have uh, a public opportunity to show them up. Okay, time for a couple of things I like, and then we'll do some things that I hate. So, things I like today. This year marks the 20th anniversary of The Sopranos. So I will admit that the first time around, I was a little too young to watch The Sopranos, so I've been re-watching it, and it is obviously really R-rated. It's a very R-rated show, but it is also a terrific show. I mean, the way that it is written, it's a beautifully written show. It's well acted. James Gandolfini is terrific in the show. And there's a shockingly moral undercurrent to the show, which is that if you are an evil person who justifies evil acts to yourselves, there are serious consequences to that. Here's a little bit of the trailer for the original Sopranos. By the time I was a kid, I knew I'd run a family business. What line of work are you in? Waste management consultant. It's a gift from Tony Soprano. Are you in the mafia? This is overdue. Am I in the what? Like my uncle ran it. Like my father ran it. I'd run it. So the show, the show is really good, and people glorify in sort of gangster movies. You can stop it there. People, people glorify in gangster movies specifically because they sort of live vicarious through through the characters. If there were no moral rules, then this is what we would do with our free time. We would all be gangsters, right? We'd run around at strip clubs and blow things up, which is why you actually do need a moral society. So the the so the subversive undercurrent of this show is that the guys in The Godfather are actually bad guys, and that the guys in The Sopranos are actually bad guys. So. It's, it's worth the watch if you've never seen it and if you can handle, you know, graphic violence and nudity, but you're an American, so you probably can. Okay, time for some things that I hate. Okay, so thing I hate, number one, Stephen Colbert is just a hack. Dude's a hack. Okay, so Stephen Colbert is, uh, it's funny to me that there are certain people who feel they need to pretend that Stephen Colbert is funny. Like, as a political stance, we have to pretend people are funny now. We have to pretend Hannah Gadsby is funny, the least funny human being maybe ever to walk the planet. It's, it's legitimately between like her and a third century priest for, for the, if we had to, like history of the planet, least funny people, Hannah Gadsby, third century priest. That's pretty much, those are pretty much the contenders. And then we also have to pretend that like Samantha Bee is funny. Samantha Bee hasn't told a joke in several years. There was a point when Samantha Bee was funny. And then being the woke, the, 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 the woke queen uh, went to her head. And then Jimmy Kimmel used to be a lot more funny. And then being the woke Pope went to his head. Well, Stephen Colbert put out a tweet this morning that says, we got our hands on Trump's handwritten State of the Union address. Okay, if you were a child and you were making a joke about this, what, what joke would you make? What would the punchline be? The punchline would be a badly spelled crayon scrawling, right? I mean, that's, that would be the punchline. That's the most obvious punchline in the world. What do you think Stephen Colbert tweeted out? A crayon scrawled, poorly spelled letter. I mean, and here's what it says. Dearest America, because, and it's funny because like some of the E's are backwards and stuff. The state of our onion is strong, like my boss, crossed out, friend Putin. In collusion, in conclusion, builds wall, eat hamburger, Donnie T, U.S. Prez. Somewhere, somewhere all the clowns weep. Somewhere all the comedians roll over in their graves. Somewhere comedy shrieks its final cry to the sky and dies as Stephen Colbert beats it to death with an ax and buries it in a cornfield in Iowa. Because my goodness, but it's, that's not important. It's not funny that he, be, it, he doesn't have to be funny. He just has to be correct politically. That's the only thing that matters. Okay, speaking of people who are out of their mind, and I'm not sure whether they're trying comedy or not. So people for the ethical treatment of animals, it, it, as somebody who actually is sort of friendly to animal, I won't say animal rights, but to, to humane treatment of animals, I'm very friendly to humane treatment of animals arguments. I've said before, I think there's actually a, a not indecent case for vegetarianism or even veganism, especially as we develop alternative sources of food, especially as we develop ways to get the protein that we need without killing animals. Like, I'm actually kind of friendly to that argument. PETA is insane. Like, the people, the people for the ethical treatment of animals, if I could construct a group that would make people want to eat meat, it would be people for the ethical treatment of animals. It's unbelievable. Like, all they do full-time, full-time, is just shoot themselves in both feet. And then they look down, and if there are any toes left, they continue to pull the trigger until all toes have been obliterated. So PETA put out an ad yesterday based on the, the toxic masculinity nonsense that's going around the internet, in which, I even hesitate to show this because it's just that bad, in which, I kid you not, they strapped 
certain vegetables to the genital area of unattractive men and then say that veganism makes men more virile. So with that introduction, you've been warned. So if you want to close your eyes now, if you're a subscriber, or if you wish to fast forward beyond this, you have my permission because it's horrifying. My retinas have already been scorched by this. So I, it's, it's stuff I can't unsee. So I've already, I've already viewed this and now it can't be unseen. I, I warn you now, if you have an innocent mind, if you are a, a person of decent moral character, protect, your, protect thyself. But if you're just too curious based on this pitch, which is probably the case, then view, gaze upon in horror, the works of man. That is a carrot that is doubling as a man's genitals. Okay, and it goes on like this for like two minutes. Just people dancing with like eggplants strapped to their genitals. And the case that they are making is that you shouldn't eat meat because vegetables make you more virile. Well, if the case is that you should be more virile like these guys, there will never be another man who eats a vegetable ever. Because these guys, I mean, nothing has made me want to eat fruits and vegetables less than this commercial. <laughs> this is, the, it's, it's just horrifying. Now, all that matters online is that you get attention. So PETA is just trolling for attention, obviously. You can, please stop it, please. For the love of God, stop it, please stop it. That's enough. Okay, thank you. If PETA want, again, it just goes to show you that we now live in a world where trolling is everything. So PETA is not going to convince anyone. I have to imagine they know they're not going to convince anyone with this. That nobody was sitting around going, you know what? I wanted to eat chicken tonight, but now that I've seen this beta soy boy walking around with a giant carrot strapped to his pants, now I'm, from now on, I'm, it's salads for me. Like if PETA knows that that's not what's happening, right? I mean, so PETA realizes that. But what they're doing is they're servicing their base. Everything in politics has become fan service. President Trump is into fan service. Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez is into fan service. PETA is into fan service. Gillette is into fan service. Now, listen, I'm in a business where fan service matters. But if you are a decent person, then you might want to spend a little bit more time thinking less about fan service and more about how you convince people. Like if your actual mission as PETA is to get people to stop eating meat, then maybe the best way to get people to stop eating meat is to make the case that people should just be more humane. And that doesn't mean saying that Eating chicken is a holocaust on your plate, which is something that PETA said. And then they had pictures of like chickens in, in cages as though a chicken is a Jew. Right? That's not going to convince anybody. But when nobody's focused on convincing anymore, right now everybody is focused very much on pointing fingers at each other and, and yelling as loudly as, as possible. That's really the only thing that matters in the world right now. Okay, uh, the one other thing that I hate, and I would be remiss to, to mention, to, to skip it today. Um, there's a story about Michael Cohen that I don't know whether to love it or hate it because it's, it's pretty glorious, I will admit. Michael Cohen, the president's former personal attorney. So his new one is Rudy Giuliani. As I've said, this is the worst job in the world. Michael Cohen also had one of the worst jobs in the world. He was the president's personal attorney, but when the president was not president, so that meant he was basically his payoff man. Apparently he hired an IT firm to rig early drudge polls and CNBC polls to favor President Trump. But that's not the only thing that he hired the IT firm to do. Michael Cohen also hired the IT firm to set up a Women for Cohen page. I kid you not, a Women for Cohen page that portrayed him as a sexy, sexy man. He, th this is what the Daily Beast reports. Okay, so it says that Michael Cohen hired an IT firm to rig online polls in favor of President Trump, and he instructed the company to create the at Women for Cohen Twitter account to loud how sexually attractive he is, according to the Wall Street Journal. Trump's then attorney promised to pay 50 grand to a small tech firm run by a Liberty University staffer to help distort online polls at CNBC and Drudge Report. Cohen has confirmed the bombshell report, but the only really interesting part of the report is that he felt the need to create a Women for Cohen Twitter account in May 2016. The Twitter account heralded Cohen as a sex symbol. I kid you not. It says, this is the little caption that he paid them to, to set up. Women who love and support Michael Cohen. This thing had like a follower. Women who, and it was, and it was I, I assume his wife, but I have no idea. It says, women who love and support Michael Cohen. Strong, pit bull, sex symbol, no nonsense, business oriented, and ready to make a difference. Women for Cohen, he had them set that up in May 2016 with pay. Just shows you the lengths that human beings will go for attention and love. They'll even make up groups about how sexy they are. I mean, first of all, there are those of us who don't have to pay to make up groups like that. Michael Cohen. But second of all, like, really? You're going to I can't. The president does not surround himself with all the best people. That's all, that's all I can say. The president does not. His brag that all the best people. It's only the best. No, no. He does not have all the best people. 
and it has been a problem. All righty, well, we will be back here a little bit later with our live daily show, so you can check that out if you're a subscriber. If not, then you can listen to us tomorrow. We'll see you then. This is The Ben Shapiro Show. The Ben Shapiro Show is produced by Senya Villarreal, executive producer Jeremy Boring, senior producer Jonathan Hay. Our supervising producer is Mathis Glover, and our technical producer is Austin Stevens, edited by Adam Saievitz. Audio is mixed by Mike Caromina. Hair and makeup is by Jesua Olvera. Production assistant, Nick Sheehan. The Ben Shapiro Show is a Daily Wire production. Copyright Daily Wire 2019.